sober mind, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. I'm not sure if you heard or felt you know, the juxtaposition or the contrast between the song we just heard and the scripture we just heard. In the song, we were praying together in that song that the war is over. And that's absolutely true. In Jesus Christ, the war is over. We know how the story ends. Don't want to give you a big spoiler here, but God wins. All right? Jesus on the throne of heaven, left glory, came as one of us, hung on a cross, God with us, bore our sins, took our shame, broke the back of sin and death and hell. He died and three days later, he rose again and he's victorious. Someone please say amen. amen. I mean, we know how the story ends. The war is over and yet, we just heard that scripture reminding us that our enemy prowls around like a roaring lion seeking, looking for someone to devour. The battle is still being fought. You say, well, wait, wait a minute. Which is, is the war over or is the battle still being fought? And the answer is both. God has won the final victory, but there's still sort of a mop-up operation going on. It's like in, in, in real wars, when, when there's a victor, there's still sort of the cleaning up, and some people haven't got the memo yet that this thing's over. They're still fighting. There's still, there's still some battles going on, but the whole tide has changed, and the victory's been won. Well, that's where we are spiritually, and, and we're talking these five weeks about the supernatural world, the reality that there is a natural world made by a supernatural God who rules over all things. That supernatural God can intersect with our natural world. We talked last week about the idea of miracles, where something isn't a natural happening as we understand natural things. It's not a coincidence, but there's something beyond that where God invades and breaks in, and that's called miraculous. God breaks in in his supernatural power into our natural world. That happens because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's still doing that, sometimes more than we notice. But today we're talking about the reality that there are beings other than just human beings and God. But there are also angelic beings. There are beings made by God for a certain purpose. Some of those angelic beings rebelled against God and fell. They're called demons. And among those fallen angels, among the demons, there's one that has sort of stepped up above others that's more well known. His name is Satan. And, and some of you are like, oh, I don't want to talk. I came to church to be encouraged. Trust me, by the time we're done, you will be encouraged. But you have to understand what the Bible teaches and what we believe as biblical Christians about the spiritual world, about what's going on. So today we're talking about the fact that the spiritual world really exists and understanding angels, demons, and Satan. How does that all work? What's going on there? And we have to understand that God is real, but so are angels, demons, and so is Satan. In Job chapter one, one of the oldest books in the Bible, in Job chapter one, beginning in verse six, we read this. One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? And Satan answered the Lord from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Now, when you understand the biblical teaching, you realize, and I think some people sort of think of angels and demons as sort of this totally different class of beings, but God made the angelic heavenly host. And some, those that rebelled, we call demons. And so we have to understand the reality of, of, the, of the spiritual world. And it's all through the Bible. And I believe it's part of our world today. But I want to talk for a minute about our attitude about the angelic and demonic world. And the fact that it has no impact on the reality of this world. Some people say this. Well, I don't, I don't like the idea of talking about the demonic world. It seems like everybody kind of, everybody kind of likes Angels, even non-believers, you know, like pictures of angels and you know, angels. Angels, we're good with angels are fine because they're nice and friendly and helpful, you know. But fallen angels, some people say, I don't, I don't like that. I don't want to think about that. I don't want to talk about it. Or somebody say, I don't even, I don't believe in demons. Well, guess what? They believe in you. They know you're real. They know your address. And so when you say I don't believe in demons, it doesn't change the reality that demons exist. 
What it does when you say you don't believe in demons is it makes you vulnerable. Because you're ignoring an enemy that's actually really there. And just saying something doesn't exist and closing your eyes and ignoring it doesn't make it go away. It makes you more in danger. So I want to challenge you today to really listen. And we're going to talk about what the Bible says about angels, what the Bible says about fallen angels, demons and Satan. But what we really want to get to is what the, what the Bible says about the authority and the power of Jesus Christ over all things. And the authority we have if we're a follower of Jesus, with Jesus in us against the work of the enemy. Because the war is over, but the battle is still raging, and we have to be ready to enter into and fight those battles. There's, there's a great passage that we, read, or that we heard earlier in the video, but I want to read a little bit more of it. And it says this. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. But listen to the exhortation. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Dealing with the attack of evil in our world and demonic, satanic stuff that happens in our world that we often don't notice and put our finger on, but there's a lot of conflict and a lot of tension. There's, I sometimes watch what's happening in our world with how people relate and what's going on. I just go, this is so, so demonic. This, people won't even talk to each other. The hostility and the anger, and I think Satan just delights in the way that people don't relate to each other, in, 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 in the perversity of what, what is acceptable in our culture that used to be seen as profane and unholy, and now it's seen as just the way it is. And I think Satan just delights in this stuff. There's a battle going on, and we have to recognize it. And so I want to think first about, about angelic beings, and I want to give you just a biblical snapshot. And, and, and this could be you know, 10 hours of teaching, but I want to just kind of give you a snapshot of the main things the Bible says about angels. So what does the Bible teach about angels? Number one, and remember, all this is on the website. You can download everything you see on the screen, all the passages, all the references is there, so don't feel like you have to write all this down. Just really kind of hear. Number one, they praise and worship God. Angelic beings, one of the things they do is they give glory to God because they see his glory and they can't help but praise him. In Isaiah chapter six, beginning in verse one, we read this. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on the throne. The train of his robes filled the temple. And above him were these angelic beings. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet. With two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And in Revelation chapter five, we have another picture. And get the magnitude of this. Revelation 5, 11. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and 10,000 times 10,000. That's a lot of angelic beings. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and in a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Angelic beings, one of the things they do is they give glory to God and praise God because they see his glory and they're compelled to worship. What else do they do? They serve God. Psalm 103 verse 20 says this, praise the Lord, you angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding and obey his word. Angels that did not rebel but follow God, are, are, they, they do his work. They, they, they serve God by doing what? Whatever God asks them to do. What do angels do? They bring judgment. Revelation 7 and 8. I can't read all of Revelation 7 and 8, but when you read it, you see that there's this there's cataclysmic moment when, when judgment is coming on this broken, sinful world. And, God, and, and it says, and the angel undid the seal, and the angel blew the trumpet, and the angel, and these angels are part of this, this judgment. So angels in some way are God's messengers in moments of judgment. That's one of the things that angels do. What do angels do? They bring answers to prayer. Sometimes our prayers come, uh, our, sometimes the answers to our prayers come through angels. In Acts chapter 12, beginning in verse 5, uh, Peter is, is locked up in prison and he's for preaching the gospel, for following Jesus. And we read this. So Peter was kept in prison and the church, I love this, was earnestly praying to God for him. God's people were together praying for his deliverance. So God answers by sending an angel. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, 
Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries stood guard at the entrance. I mean, he was secured. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side, woke him up. Quick, get up, he said. And the chains fell off Peter's wrists. And Peter, accompanied by the angel, walks out. Somebody say, pretty cool. <laughs> that's, that's, I get an amen, I can't get a pretty cool? Come on. That, 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 you, you go, man, that's amazing. Right? Uh, what, what is it that, that angels do? One of the things they do is, is, is they, they protect, they answer prayer. I, I, I read that story and you see this angel showing up to protect Peter. And I, some of you are thinking, man, I'd, I'd love that. I mean, wouldn't it be cool if an, an angel protected me? Well, let me ask you a question. How do you know one hasn't? How do you know? Now, Peter could see the angel, but he thought, kind of thought it was a dream. He was trying to figure it all out. I, th- I, th- I look at life this way, and I, the older I get, the more I think about it. I look back at my childhood. I should have been dead a thousand times. <laughs> I think on the other side of glory, I may look back and see that I mean, there were angels catching me all over the place. When I, this is true. When I was a kid, there was this thing we did in the, in the, in the playground called a death drop. Okay, remember in playgrounds, they used to have like the, the three chin-up bars, like the, the small one, the medium one, then the really high one, right? And underneath it was not like 18 inches of foam and padding. Underneath it was not like 16 inches of, of wood chips for a soft landing. It was pavement. Anybody remember this? Black pavement. And what would we do? We would sit on the highest bar. This is, I don't know if you remember, I would do this with my friends. We'd sit on the highest bar and then you'd fall backwards and you'd catch your legs, both legs right here, you do a half turn, you'd let go, and you'd land on your feet. But you'd land on your feet about the 25th time you tried it. <laughs> the first 24 times, I remember, I mean, head first, face first. I was going to learn this thing. I was going to do a death drop. And did anybody else, am I the only one? Anyways, but I, I, it was pavement. I look back and go, maybe 10 angels? I don't know. How, what, you know but I, I, I really wonder, and I, and I don't think we have to try to always pull the veil back to see what's going on, but I think one day the veil will be pulled back and we'll go, wow. God was more at work and more present, answering prayers in lots of different ways. I think there are things that people who prayed for me before I was a Christian, that God protected me in many, many ways. What do angels do? They're part of organic outreach. Angels are part of evangelism. You say, what are you talking about? Acts chapter 8. Verse 26, now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. And the story unfolds. I can't read it all for you now, but he goes there. He has this encounter. There's a person who's reading the Bible, reading one of the prophets, doesn't know what's going on. And it becomes this great conversation and he gets to hear the gospel. So God used an angel in that journey of sharing the message of Jesus. I think that when we actually engage <coughs> in meaningful, intentional evangelism, organic outreach, sharing our faith. I believe that God partners with us by sending messengers. I don't, we don't see them, or don't, usually don't see them, but I believe that God is doing more than we realize. What do angels do? They are mighty warriors. Do you remember in the Bible when an angel bumped into any person in biblical times? Remember the first thing an angel had to say to people? Anybody know? Fear not. Don't be afraid. Why? Because they were, these, were, these were powerful, glorious beings. And, and a natural thing was just to be in awe of their might. Jesus is about to go to the cross. He's about to die for our sins. And one of his disciples whips out his sword because there's people coming to take Jesus and starts to get ready to fight. Actually slices one guy's ear off, starts to fight. And Jesus says this, put your sword back in its place. This is Matthew 26, 52. Put your sword back in its place. Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. And listen to what Jesus says. Do you not think that do you do you think that I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. Jesus says, "Listen, if I wanted to fight right now, all I'd have to say is, Father, dozen legions, two dozen legions, what are angels, boom. And there would be a heavenly army right there." Jesus says, "If I want to win this battle that way, Jesus, I'm going to win by going to the cross. But if I wanted to fight, Trust me, I have an army. We have to understand that that's part of what angels do. What do angels do? They are heavenly messengers. The word angel actually means messenger. And all through the Bible, you see angels showing up, giving people messages from God, even around the birth of Jesus. The angels coming and speaking to Mary and speaking to Joseph and and bringing messages from the throne room of God. Very important distinction. Please hear this. Angels do not become people 
and people do not become angels. That's a big misunderstanding among lots of people. People say, well, you know, sometimes angels would appear as a person so they wouldn't freak people out, or so that, you know, but they, they weren't becoming people, they just appeared that way. But there, there are classes of beings. There's God who is divinity, there's human beings, and then there's angelic beings. And some of those angelic beings fell and are called demons, and one among them kind of ascended to a place of higher authority, and we call him Satan, but those are angelic beings. But we as people don't one day become angels. And I have heard people say, well, maybe that person died because God needed another angel in heaven. For lots of reasons, I don't think that's a good way of thinking, but there's nothing in the Bible that says human beings some sort of evolve into angels someday. We will have resurrection bodies, we'll have glorified bodies, but we, won't, we don't become angels. Those are separate, a separate class and kind of being. A couple of great stories in the Bible where we see angels working. One is found in 2 Kings chapter 6. I alluded to this last week when I was preaching on miracles. But Elisha, the prophet, is in the city of Dothan with his servant. And the king of the Arameans finds out where Elisha is. He wants him dead because Elisha is telling everybody, telling the, the king of Israel all of his plans <coughs> for military, his military conquest because God was telling Elisha and Elisha was telling the king of Israel. So he goes and they literally take an army and they surround the city. So the next morning, Elisha and his servant walk out of the city and they see this army of the Arameans, their sworn enemies, ready to kill them. And here's what we read in verse 15 of 2 Kings 6. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Listen to Elisha. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And here's Elisha's servant doing the math. Me, Elisha, two. <laughs> surrounding, the, I mean, completely surrounding the city. An army of their enemies, the army of the Arameans. You don't have to do the math. Lots more than two. But Elisha says, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha's servant can't see it, but Elisha can. Sometimes God takes the veil of the natural and the supernatural and pulls it back and gives us a glimpse and so Elisha prays, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. This is what Elisha has already seen. Then the Lord opened his, the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. They may have been surrounded by the enemy, but the enemy was surrounded by the army of God. The picture is one that we should hold in our hearts because we don't often get a chance to see behind the veil and see what's really going on, but God is present and his messengers are at work more than we realize and more than we know. In Daniel chapter 10, another wonderful story of Daniel who, who won't bend his knee and acquiesce to the authorities of the political world. He pushes back against that, so he's thrown into this den of lions who are hungry and looking for dinner. And the next morning, the king comes and says, Daniel, are you still alive? And Daniel answered, May the king live forever. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. Daniel says, you know, God sent an angel and the angel's like, muzzle, muzzle, muzzle. You know, that no, the claws weren't coming out, the mouths weren't eating, and you go, how does that work? God sent an angelic being. And, and I, again, I, I don't think that we need to spend our days trying to figure out, oh, is there an angel? I don't think that's our thinking. But understand that God is at work in lots of ways and there is a spiritual world around us. So should we think or care about angels? The kind of, kind of wrap up the angel conversation. Should we be thinking and caring about angels? First, we should be aware of and thankful for God's power released through his heavenly messengers. We should say, God, thank you that you're at work protecting and working and speaking in lots of ways, including through angelic beings. But... We should not fixate on them, wor worship them. You don't worship angels, ever, never. We worship only God, amen? amen. And, and, and even when angels showed up, sometimes people would want to bow down and they'd be like, don't do that. That's for God alone, right? Uh, and we should not make them a key part of our daily spiritual journey. I don't think we should be looking for angels, trying to figure out the whole angelic thing. I don't think that, we, God's at work and there, there's the physical world, the supernatural world, the natural world and the supernatural, God's at work and sometimes we'll get a glimpse of it but just knowing that God is at work should be enough, but we're not all day long trying to figure out what's going on. I don't think that's where our focus should be. And then the other side of that coin, fallen angels, demons. What does the Bible teach about Satan and demons? First, the Bible teaches that, they, that demons are fallen angels. 2 Peter 2, 4 says this. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, 
but he sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. He's saying there, there are some angels that fell, some that turned from him. What does the Bible say about Satan and demons? They are enemies of God, vicious, violent, and strategic. If you read Matthew 4 and Luke 4, this is when Satan comes and tries, Satan, this fallen angel, this demonic being, Satan comes and tries to deceive and attempt Jesus. I love that every single time Jesus takes the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and he says, it is written, it is written, it is written. And he fights back with God's word. But, but if the enemy would strategically go after, go after Jesus, for us to think that we're somehow exempt, he's not gonna come after us? No, we need to be ready. We need to be prepared to stand and to fight. What does the Bible say about demons and about Satan? They seek to destroy lives. Let me be very clear about this. Anybody who thinks that this is how the spiritual world works. Okay, there's God and Christians and angels. They're kind of on the same team. And then there's Satan and non-Christians and people rebellious against God and demons, and they're all on the same team. So Satan and demons like non-believers and care about them and want to give them a great life. Wrong. Demonic beings hate and want to destroy everyone and everything. So someone who's not a believer who says, well, I, you know, and, and can I say right now that Right now, our, the, the, the media options in our culture, are, it's, it's become almost insane how much is available. But there are tons and tons of shows on right now that dabble with the occult and with demonic stuff. And I mean, with characters, that, and they, they show, well, these are the nice demons, and these are the mean demons, and these are the, no, there's no nice demons. And I just want to challenge you, don't, don't mess with that stuff. Um, don't, don't let your mind be influenced to think in any way other than biblically. And if there's shows that you really like the show because really, it's really cool, but it's all this the, kind of this stuff, I would encourage you to really search your heart. If you're a follower of Jesus, say, do I need to be putting this stuff in my heart and my mind? I want to just talk to God about this. Say, God, is this, is this stuff really helping me think and understand the reality of the natural world and the supernatural world? What do Satan and demons do? They tempt and entice people to sin and rebel against God. That, that's like a full-time job is to get people to turn their heart and to rebel against God. What do Satan and demons do? They lie and they deceive. Lying is their natural tongue. It is their language. And they lie all the time. And lie about you, lie to you, and, and we need to battle that. What do Satan and demons do? They torment people, and they do. They torment people. And I wanna I want give you two words, very important words. One is possession, one is oppression. And see, people talk about, well, can a person, and people ask me, well, can a Christian be possessed by a demon? I would describe possession this way. Possession is when something moves into a person, sort of takes over their life. Oppression is when something's on the outside trying to influence and pressure. So, so, so Satan tried to oppress Jesus when he was in the wilderness. But Satan could not enter into and possess Jesus. And here's what I believe. Biblically, this is what I believe. If a person has come to the cross, received Jesus Christ, and when you receive Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit of the living God moves into you. I don't believe that demons or Satan can possess you. You are possessed by the Spirit of God. You belong to God. I believe that. But they can try to oppress and come from the outside and try to put pressure on you. And we need to recognize that. And we're going to talk in a moment about how we overcome those things in battle because there's incredible power in the name of Jesus. But I, I remember my first encounter with something that I, that I recognized as truly demonic. I'd been a Christian about three years, so I was 18 years old, hadn't been to Bible, I was still just going to community college, I hadn't gone to Bible college, hadn't got a Bible degree, but I'd been a Christian three years. So I'd read through the Bible, I think like five or six times by then. So I, and, I, and I didn't grow up in the church, I didn't grow up in a charismatic church that talked about how to battle these things, but and so, so I'm at this camp at Forest Home, which is actually the camp where Billy Graham felt his call to, to evangelistic ministry, that final call to ministry, I was at that camp, campground with a group of students, and I was in college and some high school kids, and this one high school guy who was this warm, friendly guy, but he was not a believer yet, and through the couple days of camp, he just got more and more sullen and withdrawn and just kind of dark, and it was really, he just kept pulling away and pulling away and pulling away. By the last night, I'm in the main meeting hall where we're going to have the last session where they're going to share the gospel of Jesus, and, and, and he comes walking up to me. And the only way I can describe it is he looked at me, it was with like the most murderous, hateful rage of anybody I've ever seen. And I actually found myself, some of you will understand this, but as he came towards me, I saw his eyes and I went like this. I just got, I got like in, in the fight, the fight I, mean, I just this, this guy's gonna rip into my face with his claw, just, there was something horrible. 
And he tried to talk to me, and he was literally choking. He couldn't talk, and he turned around and he ran. Now, again, I didn't grow up in the church at all, and I didn't grow up in any church that dealt with this kind of stuff, but I'd read the Bible a lot, and I'd seen how Jesus handled this kind of stuff, and I knew exactly what it was. And I grabbed a couple people, and I said, start praying right now. I gotta go get that guy. And I just ran after him and took off after down the hall in this bathroom. He was actually in the corner of the bathroom cowering, just like he was trapped. And I, and I, just, I just said, I just did what I'd seen Jesus do all through the Bible. I just said, I just said, in Jesus' name and his power, you cannot have him. Get out of him. Leave him alone. I didn't have all the fancy words. I said, stop it. Get out of him, Satan. You're done. Get out of here. And this guy just dropped and hit the ground with a thud like he was dead. And I stood there, and then a couple of other people came in. They'd, they'd seen me going. Got some of the people came in. They brought a nurse in, and they brought the youth pastor in. I was just a volunteer college kid helping out. But, um, but they took him, and he kind of regained consciousness, and they talked with him, and he basically said each day uh, these voices were talking to him, getting louder and louder and louder, saying, do all kinds of profane and horrible things, and particularly to kill me. And that's what he was hearing in the days leading up to this. And so the youth pastor actually said to him and pulled me into the conversation and said, I think this would be a good time for you to accept Jesus because you don't want to mess with this stuff anymore. You need Jesus in you. And he said, absolutely. And he prayed to receive Jesus Christ. And, uh, and, and I told him, I, remember, and I, was, I said, listen, you should start memorizing Bible passages because Jesus, when he was fighting the enemy, he just kept quoting scripture. This guy went on to memorize 20 chapters of Proverbs. I mean, he's like, okay, I need, I need some Bible passages, you know, and a bunch of other passages. But this guy's, this guy's life was changed. And, and I could probably, in my 40 years as a Christian now, I have probably 12 to 15 experiences that I could say that was clearly, where the veil was back enough where I could go, I know what that is. And some of you have had those moments where you've encountered situations where you just go, this is too dark and too evil, and too, there's something going on more than just the natural stuff. There's something, there's a battle going on here. And, and so how, how do we uh, walk in victory, in the victory of Jesus, and stand against the devil and demons. We, shouldn't, we, we don't spend all day worrying about this, but we better be ready to stand and to fight. And so here's some biblical ideas for you to hold on to. First, we speak and pray in the power of the name of Jesus. When you encounter something like that, you pray in the name, in the authority, in the power of Jesus. And you speak in the name, in the authority, in the power of Jesus. Philippians 2.9 says this. Therefore, God exalted him, Jesus, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If you know Jesus Christ, if the living God has moved into you by his spirit, you can stand and speak and pray in the power and the authority of the name of Jesus. But listen closely. To pray in the name of Jesus doesn't mean just to throw his name around like a magic charm. Why can't you just say that name? No, it means you speak in his authority because he lives in you and you walk with him. And so here's the second thing I want you to, to think about. Don't mess with this if you don't know and believe in the power of Jesus. If you're dealing with somebody and you think there is something really dark going on, something demonic and something satanic, don't mess with that unless you know that you're walking close with Jesus and believe in his power. Go find somebody who's walking close with Jesus and ask them to come with you. And, and there's this amazing story in the Bible in Acts chapter 19. Some of you will go, I've never heard this story. I've certainly never heard it preached on. But I want to read a short story from the book of Acts chapter 19. These are people that are trying to use the name of Jesus like a magic lucky charm and not knowing Jesus. And watch what happens. Acts 19 beginning in verse 14. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day, the evil spirit answered them, listen to this, Jesus I know, Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all, and he gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. They were trying to use the name of Jesus like a lucky charm. like oh, uh, uh, the, uh, the name of Jesus that that guy Paul uses, well, Paul could use that name with authority. Why? Because Le Jesus lived in Paul and he spoke in the authority. He was speaking in the name of Jesus. Like an ambassador speaks on the name of their country. When you're a Christian and God lives in you, you speak in the name, the power of Jesus. So don't dabble with this or mess with this unless you really know Jesus and you're walking with him. Understand that the one who is in you is far greater than the one who dwells in this earth. 
understand the power of Jesus is greater. You may not have power to overcome the evil one, but Jesus does every single time. In 1 John 4, 4, we read this. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Someone say amen. amen. The one who dwells in you if you're a Christian is greater than the one who's in the world. When we stand against the devil and the power of Jesus, he runs. James 4, 7. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and God will come near to you. Uh, the journey of our life needs to be resisting, standing against the lies of the enemy, the enticements of the enemy, and turning away from that, and resisting him in the name of Jesus, and he runs, and then drawing near to God, and let God come closer and closer and closer to you. I know for Sherry and I, one of the things that we do when we're encountering what we really sense is the enemy at work in some way, is we immediately begin to pray over our entire family, each of our sons by name, now their wives by name, now our first grandchild on the way by name, every one of them, we pray that the blood of Jesus Christ and the victory of his, his death on the cross and the victory of the grave would be theirs, and we pray for God's protection over them. We've got to pray in the name of Jesus, the power and the protection of Jesus Christ, because there is a battle going on. We need to wear the spiritual armor that God gives I'm doing this more often. My wife, every, my wife, every morning, every day of her life, she gets up and she reads this passage and she, she just thinks about this battle that's going on. It says, stand firm then with a belt of truth buckled around your waist. Truth. With a breastplate of righteousness, living a righteous life in place. With your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Then you hold the gospel and you walk in the truth of the gospel. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish, listen to this, all the flaming arrows of the evil one. You put on the shield of faith and your faith protects you from the enemy. Take the helmet of salvation. You gotta know Jesus. The helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Know this book and know God's truth and be ready to say, it is written, it is written, it is written. I know the truth. I stand on it. And then flee from sin and flee from rebellion against God and, and turn your heart more and more and more to Jesus and walk in his power. Lord Jesus, I pray for each person gathered here today, for each person in our family worship venue, each person who's online right now. And I know, Lord, we have brothers and sisters online around the world that are part of this community. Will you help us learn to walk in the victory of Jesus Christ? Help us not be paranoid or freaked out or always thinking about the spiritual world, but help us be profoundly aware that it is real. In those moments when the veil is kind of the, just turned back a little and we see a battle going on, let us stand in the power and the victory and the authority of Jesus Christ and of Jesus alone.